So let me switch to, to English for the, for the presentation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it took a while, but I'm happy to, to have made it. So I'm a professor at the University of Chicago in the Department of Ecology and Evolution. I'm also an external faculty at the Santa Fe Institute, uh, an institute for the study of complex systems. And um, I've been very interested in this relation between transmission dynamics of infectious diseases and environmental change. And today I will talk in particular uh, through some examples about how we can uh, study this uh, relationship and go from uh, time series data to underlying processes uh, using epidemiological models. So I will um, present some examples from um, one particular vector-borne disease, uh, that is malaria and plasmodium uh, falciparum malaria in particular. So I have shortened this lecture. I intended to, to talk uh, about dengue at the end, but there is no time. So I will mention at the end a few, um, a few things about what we are doing there. But here I'm going to use uh, two examples um, on how we can, as I said, infer process from, from data. And, and use malaria, which is a well-known disease for most of, uh, for most of you. Uh, a disease transmitted by a mosquito vector and with a complex life cycle. Now, when we think about the effect of climate change, we, we think primarily about the, the effect of long-term long trends of averages in terms of uh, space and time. But uh, we need to consider that uh, the impact, impacts of climate change on infectious diseases will occur primarily through seasonal and interannual variability, as well as extreme events. So through the faster scales of uh, variability and not just the trends. So most of my work has been on uh, climate variability, that is the multi-year cycles that affect, um, that affect disease dynamics. And when we think of climate forcing in general, the, the regions we expect to be most susceptible to the impacts uh, will be those that uh, are at the edge of the distribution of the disease. This, these regions fall in highlands because of the effect of temperature on altitude, and also at the edge of deserts, where there is a limitation um, on the rainfall for the mosquitoes. So here, the, the climate variables are the limiting factors that determine the distribution. So we expect to be important factors in the dynamics. And characteristically in these regions, transmission rates are low, and the uh, dynamics are very seasonal, very epidemic, with large intermittent uh, epidemics, as shown in this example from two plantations in Kenya where you see both the long-term trend and the uh, multi-year cycles in the size of the outbreaks. So the trends from the 1970s to the 1980s and 1990s with, 90s with the increasing cases have been um, a pattern that um, generated much discussion uh, much debate on the role of global warming, on the, on the role of uh, war warmer temperatures. Another pattern of interest here that we'll discuss uh, later is the turnaround in the size of the epidemics at the, at the turn of the new century, around the, essentially from 2000 forward. You can see that the peak of the epidemics decrease, and um, there is also there have been many um, hypotheses for why this is the case. So we'll discuss both of these. Now, in um, one um, debate related to global warming is whether it is a dominant factor. And perhaps we should not uh, consider that it is so important because, after all, socioeconomic development and, and uh, enabling intervention will lead to decreases uh, in the problem. Now, these di simplistic dichotomies, in my view, are not very useful, and we need to really understand the interplay of climate and these uh, changing uh, conditions and intervention. 
Similarly, with development, we may ask what will happen as places become increasingly urbanized. So these kinds of interactions are very relevant today rather than the simple dichotomies where we just posed uh, very simple debates. What we have done in our work is to work with um, epidemiological models to basically analyze cases, time series of cases, to ask about the role of climate variables. That is, we use these models that are based on mechanism combined with statistical inference methods to say something about the role of these extrinsic drivers given the epidemiological dynamics. And the reason this um, is important is because simple analysis may, um, may fail or may not be um, sufficient in light of the potential um, nonlinear dynamics of epidemiological systems. So uh, at the present time, we have all heard about uh, the dynamics of infectious diseases in the, due to the current pandemic. You are also probably all familiar with the very simple transmission models where we think of populations as uh, composed of susceptible individuals infected individuals and those that are recovered and immune. Of course, we can have uh, variations of this, uh, of this theme. And, and here, um, the, uh, the models, the transmission rate in the, model, um, in the models uh, very much depends on uh, the variation in the number of non-immune individuals. So this makes the model nonlinear, and we know that uh, epidemics can turn around because there are not enough susceptibles. And then we need to wait until we uh, basically build the susceptibles again to have another epidemic. That's one possible reason for, um, for disease cycles. And of course, when they interact with seasonal transmission, with seasonality in transmission, we can get even more complex patterns, as illustrated here uh, in the context of a very well-studied uh, childhood diseases, measles, pre-vaccination, just to show uh, that you can get very uh, different sizes of epidemics without having uh, a specific driver that is varying in that same way. So we want to be able to, to say something about drivers, but accounting for the underlying uh, epidemi uh, epidemiological dynamics. What I will do today is to give you some examples of um, how we can use models in this way. Uh, the first example will be based on our earlier work on highland malaria and warmer temperatures in Ethiopia. And for this, um, of course, the question is one of uh, temperature change versus control. I will uh, show you some more recent results on this question. The second part, if I have time, I will switch to urban malaria now um, in a desert fringe, in a, an arid region, and ask about the role of uh, relative humidity rather than rainfall, and what determines seasonal epidemic size. So this will be about interannual variability rather than long-term trends. Again, as examples for the methods. So. Let me uh, put the work, before I present the model, I'm going to show you some patterns that um, led us to this work. This is in, in Ethiopia, in the highlands of Ethiopia. And here we see the patterns I already showed you for Kenya, where we see in these highlands, in this region close, uh, you see here in the map, in this small region uh, close to uh, Addis Ababa, we can see from the 80s to the 90s, the increase in cases. And this is a region of Africa where we have both falciparum and vivax malaria. This is interesting, as I'll uh, tell you later, uh, for uh, the question of whether these patterns may be caused by drug resistance. You see similar trends in both these diseases. And the problem here is that, of course, when we ask questions about trends, it becomes very difficult to uh, 
um, essentially just look at correlations because anything that exhibits an increasing trend uh, will be uh, related to the uh, to the incidence in a way that uh, does not imply causality. In particular, uh, alternative hypotheses have been have been formulated many. Uh, we have trends in the frequency of drug resistance at that time to chloroquine. Uh, we have land use change, increased human movement from lowlands, etc. So this led to, to a, uh, as I said, a very long debate on what causes these increases. And in particular, I think, uh, well, a preferred hypothesis was that uh, the evolution of drug resistance may be involved. Now, we use um, data that was essentially resolved in space and time to be able to get around this problem that any two trends are correlated and look at the variation in altitude as a way to, uh, to resolve these questions, as I'll show you in a moment. Now, here you can see that uh, in this paper, we also use data from a highland in uh, Colombia, in South America, so that we could um, also um, well consider the generality of these results. And here you have an example in, of, um, first of all, of how the, the disease expands from the low season to the high season during a large epidemic. So this happened to be an El Nino year, and you can see the, the spatial expansion. You can also see that we had a fairly high resolution at this level of administrative units called Quebeles, and this was very useful uh, for the following work. So what we ask is whether, uh, I mean, could we quantify how the spatial distribution expands upwards in warmer years? So this is a very simple pattern, but a very convincing pattern that the disease is responding, responding to climate. So what we do is we look at the distribution with altitude and we find the median as an indicator of where the sort of center of gravity of the distribution is fine. So I'm plotting here the median of the distribution as a function of mean temperature and you see the increase as the temperature goes up. Similarly, we can now plot the median altitude as a function here of time, and then also follow what was happening to temperature. And in fact, you see that during these two El Nino years, when temperature went up, um, you see this, uh, the disease climbing in altitude. A very similar pattern in the sense of um, this variation being uh, correlated with, uh, with temperature shown in Colombia. So we did this uh, small calculation. This is the spatial expansion, but we want to account for the long-term trends. So we basically converted the increases, the added cases per degree from the, alti the movement up and from the expansion uh, to what we saw in terms of the temporal trend. And these were equivalent, you can see here on the left, these uh, rough calculations, basically saying that the change in the, in the warming was sufficient to explain the rising cases. Now, all this um, is fine, let me, let me just uh, just read some, some conclusions. Of course, up to here, we could say with this very simple analysis that uh, without mitigation, climate change would result in an increase in malaria in these uh, densely populated highlands of Africa, in East Africa. And for Ethiopia, we estimated that uh, essentially from the 70s to the mid 2000s, we would have a potential would have had a potential addition of five to six million cases due to global warming. Now, this um, all this is fine, but um, when you look carefully at this data, well, I should mention two things before I go there. You can still say, well, okay, this is consistent with temperature, but what about drug resistance? I should point out 
that here it's interesting that in Ethiopia, not in other um, regions of, of uh, in other highlands uh, further south, but here we have both parasites. Interestingly, Vivax uh, did, did not present resistance to chloroquine at that time. So the drug resistance hypothesis cannot explain that both diseases, that both parasites showed similar increases. Now, you see here at the turn of the century that the epidemics decrease in size. So here comes this, as I said, this, uh, uh, this view that, OK, this must have been control. And therefore, uh, OK, climate change may have uh, created this uh, increase in incidence. But now we, um, we see that control uh, can basically um, solve this situation and, and bring this uh, turnaround and, and so on. So what we wanted to do was to use them all to ask whether effectively uh, this, um, this change could also be attributed to temperature. So the idea here is to basically ask whether temperature itself could have caused this decrease. And I should here mention that uh, in the decade that followed, we had what was called a slowdown in global warming. This, wasn't, this was a decadal change in global warming that, that we can discuss more, but I will not discuss here. You may have uh, heard about it. So the, the, the trend in uh, global warming uh, slowed down during that decade. What we wanted to ask is whether that slowdown in climate change itself could be responsible for this turnaround, since the really the increase in control in this region did not happen until the strong control in this region did not happen until 2004, 2005. So we want to know whether essentially climate may have helped control by reducing incidence earlier on. Here we, um, I just wanted to show you the concordance of the trends. If we use uh, the, the minimum temperature and the incidence from both parasites, falciparum and vivax, and uh, we isolate just the trends in the data, we did this with uh, an analysis you may be interested in. Some of you, some of you may know, know it. I, I recommend reading about it. And here is a, a useful, very useful website, both for the, uh, the software that you could use, but also the method, the papers, and so on. So this uh, is known as singular spectrum analysis. It also allows you to, to, to analyze uh, with power spectra the decomposition, but essentially this analysis will decompose this noisy time series into major orthogonal uh, components. And here I just want to show that it is interesting that uh, we find for t -min from local meteorological stations this uh, correspondence in the turn around, again, at the turn of the century. But now, can we do something better? and use epidemiological models for what we can call this counterfactual experiment. Essentially, what we will ask is uh, what would have been the temporal pattern of reported cases post-2000 based on transmission dynamics and temperature if everything else had continued as in essentially before 2000. So, if we know what the dynamics was before 2000, what would, just as a function of temperature and epidemiology, what should have been expected at the turn of the century? We can only do this with a model because we want to isolate the epidemiology and the role of temperature, which we could not do with any analysis of the time series that is just phenomenological. So for this, we use a mathematical model Sketch here in a diagram. This is a model that I'll describe in more detail later in the second part of the talk. Uh, 
At the moment, I just want to emphasize that it is uh, that I have this model that describes to some degree the epidemiology of the system, divides, we have the human population divide into susceptible, exposed, and then the infected and infectious individuals. And we also have a class, I'll discuss more later, this is a class of uh, people that um, either have immunity, temporary immunity, or can create a small reservoir of transmission. I'll return to this class later. And then we have a representation of the mosquito, which is a practical representation. Again, I'll, I'll describe in more detail in the second part of the talk. The important thing here is that our transmission rate, the force of infection, the rate that each susceptible individual experiences, will depend on temperature, on the season, and of course on the infection levels in the population, and will have some noise. We then work with the reported cases, the observed cases, and we assume that there is an error, of course, in how we report the cases. So this is the model. Again, I will uh, go into details into the second part of the talk. Here, I wanted to, measure, to mention that, uh, of course, we have a model, but now we need to fit it to the time series. So we need to find the parameters that, um, to infer the parameters from the data. And I wanted to, to mention to you uh, a method we have been used for a while, developed by my colleagues at the University of Michigan and a method that is very useful when uh, considering the parameterization of models, these dynamical models, uh, essentially based on time series data. Now, some of the major challenges on parameterizing models, models of this kind, is that we want to be able to use flexible model formulations. By this, I mean we don't want to just have maybe SIR dynamics. You may want to write something like what I just showed you, uh, where we have transmission through mosquitoes. We also have a major problem of unobserved variables, because we only measure one class in this case. We only measure the infected individuals, and we do that with error. And then we, of course, have both noise, uh, environmental noise, the model will not explain all of the dynamics, and we have um, what may be called also uh, demographic noise. Importantly, I already uh, mentioned we have measurement error uh, in the form not just of under-reporting, but some distribution of error. So we have these challenges, and this method essentially is well suited uh, to face these challenges, and it's based on uh, a sequential Monte Carlo method, essentially a particle filter. And the idea is that this method can be applied if you can simulate your model. So if you can simulate your model in the computer and you can simulate it repeatedly, then you can fit the model. I can give you um, here a very, uh, essentially an intuition of how it works for those of you that are not familiar with these methods. And if you are interested in, in learning about it, there are wonderful tutorials uh, in this place here. Uh, there is an R package that interfaces to, to a C code. And the method is called uh, likelihood maximization by iterated filter, filtering, so MIF for short. Uh, it was developed, um, the sort of statistical basis for it was presented early on. And then, um, sorry, I have the wrong date here. I will correct it later. But this paper, um, as I said, is a very good guide, and there is a very nice tutorial. Basically, the way to think about this is each particle is a simulation in the computer with a particular set of parameters. So you are going to try to find the parameters that maximize the likelihood, that is, the probability of observing the data given the model. So each you start with these particles, and then you will simulate in time. So after a small delta t, you simulate, and you compare, the for each simulation, the data and the um, essentially the simulation. And you can say 
uh, how well are you doing? You can measure, you can say what's the probability essentially of um, observing that the number of cases that you have in the time series, and that gives you a weight for how well the particle is doing at that delta t. So based on that weight, you resample the particles that, and, and essentially those that are doing well are more represented, and they give more offspring because you resample more of them. So you then uh, start the next time step with more particles around these parameters. Um, basically, the particles inherit these uh, parameters with a small random variation from the parent, and you go on and on and on. So you go along the time series, and just to, to show you a bad picture, but you go on in time. So this direction was time. So the likelihood is, is improving. And then what me the reason it's called iterated particle filter is because you repeat this process a series of iterations. So you go over in time, and you do it again and again and again. And the theory tells you that this should converge to the maximum likelihood estimation. So this will give you some parameters. It will give it will give you their confidence intervals. And again, if you want to see some details, I um, I think it's there are very good tutorials and it's really an interesting method. Now here I wanted to show you how we use it. So we fitted we fitted the mall to the data in red up to 2000 and then we predict, so these data were not used at all post-2000 to inform the model. So we can basically, um, I'm showing you here the data. The blue are the median. Since we have this stochastic model with noise, then you see here uh, the sort of the variation that we have around the median in blue. And then what we do is we have we have our predictions going forward. And what I want to point out is that the model is quite able to predict the decrease in the cases from 2000 to 2004 extremely well. Of course, after this point, the two curves separate because uh, very strong control starts at this point. So. This really um, shows you what we expect the effect of temperature to, um, to have been, and that temperature can account for the decrease at the turn of the century. So let me um, move on. I already uh, told you this conclusion. Essentially, the slowdown of the malaria trend can be explained by the decadal changes in temperature. Thus, climate change acted synergistically with control efforts. And climate conditions should be taken into consideration in other highland regions and for any plans to relax intervention efforts. That is, uh, we should be careful about complacency because in essence, climate conditions may be helping control and did help control at that time. So let me take 10 more minutes. That was an example of how we can use uh, models to, to separate here the effects and to, to basically do these uh, this, uh, numerical experiments. Uh, I like to get to a more typical example, not of trends, but of climate variability. And by that, I mean, again, the multi-year cycles rather than the trends. And for this, I'm going to move to a different part of the world where we have um, essentially an arid region, a semi-arid region here in northwest India. So this is, this is the state of Gujarat in northwest India. And I'm going to basically be working with data from two major cities, the city of Ahmedabad and the city of Surat. And in India, we have a, a mosquito vector, Anopheles stephensi, which is truly urban. That is, it, uh, it transmits in the cities, and it basically breeds in water that is stored uh, by people in homes. So that is very different than in, for example, the African continent, where we do not have truly urban vectors. 
um, although some of that may be changing. And, and here we have uh, the potential for, in this, uh, through this, this vector for malaria to basically grow with urbanization. I should point out that uh, in recent years there have been reports of this vector um, in the Horn of Africa. So it seems to, to, to have moved that far and uh, it's not clear whether it could move farther. So here I like to show you uh, the time series for both the cities. So here are the cases. This is for Plasmodium falciparum in this case. So we have the reported cases. Sorry, the reported cases are, he are here in purple, falciparum cases. And here we have the relative humidity. This is for the other city. Now, this, uh, the number of cases is not particularly high because transmission in cities is low, but also because these cities have put a tremendous effort into controlling uh, urban malaria after uh, a, a very big emergence of the problem in the 90s. And so here we have a situation where the cities are uh, spending a fair amount of effort to control the, the transmission of the disease, but you see that the, the transmission is still sustained. That is, we, the cities have not eliminated. And uh, it is interesting what explains this variation and how could one do better within these cities uh, to, to attack the, the problem. Because after all, um, although transmission in the cities may be low, it's going to also be a reservoir for, uh, for the parasite in the, in, in the regions and for the adjacent rural areas. So why am I showing humidity here? Well, we worked with the rural malaria in the region. And of course, there, since this is a, an arid region, we had very clear relationships with rainfall. And we modeled that. We did some early warning uh, system, etc. But here. Because we are in this, we are within the city, and the mosquito does not rely on water, water on the ground for for reproduction. Then, what drives these cycles? Could it be temperature? Could be could it be humidity? And I would say that uh, humidity, in this case, relative humidity, is a neglected variable in many vector transmitted diseases. Interestingly, if you, if you plot the cases added for the season versus the relative humidity in a window that is before the transmission season and includes a period that is pre-monsoons, you find this very interesting relationship also for the other city. So what we did here is essentially take again our models and use the models to compare to compare different hypotheses. We could have climate variability by relative humidity, climate variability by temperature, or uh, essentially no climate variability, so no interannual variation, just seasonality. We use our method, and then we basically compare the models as a way to compare hypotheses. So I should mention briefly that here is a model similar to what we had before, a little bit more specific in the sense that here there are two infected classes, symptomatics and, uh, symptomatics and asymptomatics, or people that have uh, contracted some level of immunity and then can lose it. And in the mosquito part, of course, one doesn't matter what these letters are, just to say that there are many molds that describe a mosquito population in different compartments, exposed. Uh, essentially, here we have the inf uh, infected, and so no, here they are exposed and then infected. But what we, I don't want to go into those details because what I showed you before was that we basically use a simplification of the mosquito, and this is for the purpose of fitting the the time series. We want to use simpler simpler mold than having to, to get all the, the mosquito parameters um, estimated, etc., or from the literature. 
So a very interesting um, way to do this is to think that essentially what the mosquito is doing is introducing a variable time delay between the force of infection, that is the rate, the rate that a susceptible individual would experience given the levels of infection at a given time, you get this time delay, that this uh, distributed time delay that has to do with the, the parasite going to the vector. Mathematically, if you want to, to basically introduce a distributed time delay, a way to do that is to have a chain of classes. And this is a well-known trick, in a sense, uh, in these kinds of models. If I just have a chain of classes here for the force of infection, it will generate a distributed time delay. So that's how we represent the mosquito, and we have our equations, uh, again, with seasonality, etc. I wanted to show you that um, just one detail of the mall. We don't have to go into details. I'm running out of time. Basically, I wanted to show you how we uh, model the transmission rate in this. Uh, this is one possibility, because it's where we introduce the covariate here, the, the time series, essentially the data on the, uh, the humidity here in particular. So in our models, you will uh, see this kind of expression for the transmission rate as a function of time, where you basically have the sum with six terms and some coefficients we estimate. This S, SK are a basis of what is called B-splines. And this is interesting because these are this is a very flexible way, because this sum will essentially capture and be able to represent any shape of the seasonality, basically by using these, uh, these six uh, functions that, uh, that are known as B-splines. And what we do is we know that uh, this is the, the fourth one here, S4. We know that it was during this time that humidity pre-transmission seemed to be acting. So we localize the effect of the, the humidity during that window of time in this particular time of the year. And then, uh, anyhow, these are just details on the model. Let me just move on. I wanted to show you how well, surprisingly, how well this model works. Again, because um, here I'm comparing the data in, in black to the, to the essentially the simulated best model obtained with the maximum likelihood estimates. The median is in purple, and then the, the essentially the quantiles that, uh, here, I think it's the, the 5 to 95 quantiles are shown in this, in this shape. But what you can see for both cities is this, uh, that we capture the interannual variation uh, very nicely uh, with humidity. And to, to show you how, um, how uh, strong this uh, driving is, here is we can also fit the model reducing the, basically using only the data up to 2009, so that then we can predict this, uh, the dynamics and see how we do with completely out of feed data. And you can see that, again, we do fairly well to show the interannual variation. And again, this is with relative humidity, a quantity that has been, as I said, neglected. This is a busy table, and I need to, to, to close. But I wanted to ma make this point. Uh, it's a little technical point. The reason this approach is interesting is also to compare hypotheses. So you can use this uh, method. You can use the, the particle filter to estimate the likelihood. That is, here I'm showing the log likelihood of the, the, the method. Of course, you want to have the highest log likelihood. So you can compare moles. This is for one city. This is for the other. So this here, we are in Surat. And we have the mole with relative humidity, temperature, and just seasonality. And you can see that the mole uh, with uh, Relative humidity is the best one here, and considerably better you can uh, than the the one uh, essentially that has uh, no um, no no interannual forcing and better than temperature. 
we can go here and we just I will mention for some of you that are used to, to see this, uh, when you compare models that differ in the number of parameters, you have to penalize the more complex models because otherwise you may just be overfitting and I could just get more and more parameters and, and do uh, and have a better fit. So we use this criterion, the Akaiki information criterion, uh, in that case to compare the models. And of course we want this to be as low as possible and you see that the model, the best model is again the one with relative humidity. So just to mention that once you have this, uh, once you have these fits uh, with different uh, drivers or different for different hypotheses, you can formally compare them and, and say something about what explains the variation. So to close here, um, climate factors should play an important role in the epidemiology of urban vector-borne infections. And again, if precipitation is no longer a direct driver here, uh, we can consider whether relative humidity can be useful, for example, for prediction. Now, I uh, should mention that uh, the work I, I will not have time to present for, for dengue in particular goes now into the spatial variation and the very fine scale spatial variation. Because to make progress, besides predicting when are we going to have a worse epidemic or a worse season, we uh, may want to, of course, identify the hotspots in the, in the city spatially. And here, um, it's very, very interesting to consider uh, both the uh, joint effect of climate with population density. And we are looking at that in dengue at very, very fine uh, resolution within cities. Um, and uh, if you like to see some uh, some published work on, on, on that front. Here is a, a reference. And uh, I think this is, this is an, of course, an area for, for further uh, investigation. In particular, because we cannot hope to, to do necessarily, we can do, um, non, well, we can do statistical models. Of course, for the mechanistic models, we cannot really hope to do um, models at this very, very high resolution that, that incorporate this level of detail. So the question of how do we go about modeling when the spatial heterogeneity is so important is, uh, I think, a critical area for the future. So let me end. Uh, thank you for your attention. And here are some of my colleagues, um, Aaron King and Ada Ionides on the statistics, Javier Rodó uh, in Barcelona, uh, with uh, whom we have worked on a lot. He knows a lot about climate. Uh, my previous graduate students, Pamela Martinez, Mauricio Santes, and then Amir Zirach, uh, who um, is from Ethiopia. Thank you very much.